Hey, it's your old pal Lucid Stew again, and in this video I'm going to share a vision that came to me out of the blue, the Great Appalachian High Speed Rail Spine. The spine will utilize the one continuous and mostly rural corridor in the east, the Great Appalachian Valley. This geologic feature stretches 1,200 miles across the North American continent from the lowlands of Quebec to the highlands of Alabama. This path is currently generally described by portions of Interstates 87, 287, 78, 81, 40, 75, and 59, as well as an amalgamation of many freight rail subdivisions. Now we'll do it with high-speed rail. Along the way, we'll connect various plausible metropolitan areas into a great eastern North American high-speed rail network. We'll talk about how fast it might be and how much it might cost. We'll start on the north end in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Here we are leaving our northern terminus, Gare Centrale. Montreal has a metro population of 4.6 million, so we'll start the counter there. Right off the bat, we would have the ability to connect to Toronto and Quebec City via the recently announced Alto Canadian High Speed Rail Line bringing our connected population to 14.7 million. Moving south across the border into the United States and into the Great Valley on the east side of Lake Champlain, we'll get a tiny bump with our first stop in Burlington, Vermont, with a metro population of 200,000. By the way, this is part of the Northern New England High Speed Rail Corridor. I made a video about it. Check it out. I have a trip between Montreal and Burlington at 50 minutes. Continuing south, we'll cross hilly, sparsely populated farmland into New York State and reach our next stop, the Great Riverfront Station of Albany, New York. Made possible by removing Interstate 787 through the city. From here, we'll hook up with the Northern New England High Speed Rail Corridor once more, as well as the Empire Corridor. That will connect a whole slew of cities from Buffalo to Boston, with metro populations totaling 10.6 million. Burlington to Albany would be 50 minutes to cover those 130 miles. Out of Albany, we will roughly parallel Interstate 87 toward the Hudson Highlands, hanging a right to cut through farmland in New York, then New Jersey, and finally Pennsylvania, before stopping in the Allentown area. From Albany, that would take just over an hour. In Allentown here, we will pick up another 850,000 souls, but also connect to New York City and the Northeast Corridor. We will have more opportunities to connect to that rail corridor, but we'll add the NEC total population now, spiking our total of potentially served people generously to 78.6 million. We will also pick up Scranton, which features a station across from Dunder Mifflin and adds another 550,000 people. Continuing west through Pennsylvania farmland along Interstate 78 and then Interstate 81, we reach Harrisburg, the capital city of Pennsylvania. That could be accomplished in a speedy 33 minutes. That adds another 600,000 people, but also affords connections to Philadelphia and Pittsburgh along the Keystone Corridor. Continuing on, now turning to the southwest while still roughly following Interstate 81, and we'll be doing so all the way into Tennessee. But first, we will cross into Maryland, West Virginia, and Virginia, all within 35 miles. And this area brings up a good point about all the smaller cities and towns along the way that we won't stop at in this video. Places like Newburgh, New York, Newton, New Jersey, Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, Hagerstown, Maryland, Martinsburg, West Virginia, Winchester, Virginia, and many other places that would benefit from being connected to all the other places listed in this video through regional service. This area also gives us one more opportunity to connect to the Northeast Corridor at Washington, D.C. Still moving through Virginia, we will pass Stoughton with an opportunity to connect to Richmond, the capital of Virginia. To this point, we've mostly been moving through farmlands in the broad ancient valley, but south of Stoughton, the terrain changes and becomes more challenging. 
the Great Valley narrows, becoming a series of narrow valleys and sharp ridges folded by eons of pressure. The valley only briefly shows itself here in places like Roanoke, Virginia, but the interstate makes it through there and worst case scenario, the interstate has an available median. 60 miles of that in the Great Valley begins to reemerge, presenting an opportunity near Wytheville and the junction with Interstate 77, a chance to reach into North Carolina and all the major cities there. Continuing southwest, the valley broadens into a series of striated, low weathered parallel hills, less challenging than our scrape with the Appalachian Mountains, but less hospitable than Pennsylvania. We finally leave Interstate 81, transitioning briefly to Interstate 40. That leads us into Tennessee and our next stop, Knoxville. Harrisburg to Knoxville at 519 miles could be traversed in about 3 hours and 15 minutes. If that's too far for your taste, a stop in Roanoke would cut that roughly in half. Knoxville has a metro population of almost 900,000. We'll add that to our running total. This is just one pairing where passenger rail currently doesn't exist, but you can imagine dozens of new regional stops creating hundreds of new origin and destination pairs. Out of Knoxville to the southwest, transitioning from roughly following Interstate 40 to roughly following Interstate 75, I'm opting for a suburban station since Chattanooga's core is difficult. Chattanooga's metro population is 550,000. We also have an opportunity here to connect to Atlanta to the southeast. That corridor actually has a tier one environmental impact statement. That would add 6.3 million people. You also have Nashville to the northwest. That's another 2 million. Out of Chattanooga, we'll transition to near Interstate 59 and cross into the northwest corner of Georgia. That is brief at 20 miles before entering Alabama. This is the southwest end of the Great Valley and the Appalachian Range. Peaks are lower, but still in the characteristic narrow ridge and valley form. Birmingham in particular is nestled amongst this terrain and a challenge to enter, but the Interstate 59 right-of-way is a worst-case possibility. Anyway, we'll stop here concluding our Great Appalachian Valley route. But that's not all! Texas, 400 miles to the west, beckons and its metropolises total over 20 million people. So we answer the call and move west. This time we find ourselves in the Interstate 20 corridor, which is another very rural interstate. This is a previously envisioned high-speed rail corridor dubbed the I-20X that would run from Atlanta to Dallas. We will duplicate that from Birmingham and cross over into Mississippi. That will take us to our next stop in Jackson, the state capital, and that will add another 600,000 people. We'll also connect to Memphis, Tennessee and New Orleans for another 2.3 million. At Vicksburg, the route will cross the Mississippi River and into Louisiana. Then it's across the Mississippi floodplain to our next stop, Shreveport. That will add a final 400,000 before crossing over into Texas. Our final destination in Texas is Dallas, part of the Dallas-Fort Worth Megaplex, home to 8.3 million people. But there's more! Various plans past and present would also connect Fort Worth, Houston, Austin, San Antonio, and Monterey, Mexico. There's a reason we kept going! That gives us a grand total metro population served of... 132.2 million. For reference, that's more than the entire population of France and Spain combined each of which currently has roughly 2,000 miles of high-speed rail right-of-way. In terms of speed, end-to-end, -end, we're looking at 1,868 miles. I have that taking just under 13 hours for a 145 mile per hour average with 10 stops. So we've described a high-speed rail spine through the eastern United States linking Canada and Mexico and potentially linking 130 million people. But what's it going to cost? Let's talk Turkey. First, let's start with the Great Appalachian Valley portion from Burlington, Vermont to Chattanooga, Tennessee. 
That is about 1,005 miles. Spine only, no connections to outside metros. I have that at $105 billion. Connections to the major adjacent metros would be $199 billion for 1,759 miles of right-of-way. That would produce a 2,764-mile Great Eastern U.S. high-speed rail system at a cost of approximately $305 billion. That would connect metros totaling 86.2 million people. Now the extensions to Dallas, Texas and Montreal, Canada. Those total 864 miles. Most of that is from Chattanooga to Dallas. I have that coming in at 81 billion. That renders a spine total of 1869 miles for $186 billion. Plugging Canada into the system will require their planned Alto High Speed Rail service. I made a video about it, check it out. I have that at about 50 billion US for 600 miles. For the various southern metros, we're looking at 1,291 miles of right of way at a cost of $143 billion. Most of that would be in Texas. Let's put all that together in a Great Eastern North American High Speed Rail system. 5,555 miles of right of way. That would cost around $580 billion. Now about 10% of that will be the responsibility of Canada and Mexico, but we are talking interstate highway system scales of investment. That took dedicated taxes, dedicated legislation, dedicated bureaucracy, and it's still not done after 70 years. Can we do it? Should we do it? You decide. And make sure to let me know what you think in the comments. For a similar, slightly smaller idea, check out my video on the Chicago Hub Network. The United States is a giant country. 4,655 miles of high-speed right-of-way would make it number two in the world. Similar to geographic area is China, which has about 25,000 miles of high-speed rail lines. So 4,500 miles is really just a start if we want to connect the country in this way. If we do it, it clearly requires thinking big. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Plenty more videos are on their way. Here's a tremendous thanks to Steve getting around Philly for helping out with NEC footage lately. Go check out his channel for premium rail and transit rants. By the way, I just launched a Printify store where I'm selling restorations of old railroad posters and maps I've run across while doing research in the Library of Congress. Check out my store link in the description for some beautiful railroad posters or if you'd like to support the channel that way. Right now I'm working toward 25,000 subscribers and taking a celebratory trip to the East Coast to ride the new Acela 2 trains when they go into service. You can also support that mission by hitting the super thanks button under the video. But that's all for now. Until next time, I'll see you on that big beautiful freeway.